that was brilliant. Oh my God, it's awesome. Um, and so I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, I think our first YPSR seminar of 2023. Um, and particularly welcome to uh, Dr. Georgia Black, who I will introduce in a moment. I'm just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. So you'll notice there that the seminar is being recorded um, and the recording will be put up on our YQSR YouTube channel. Um, so it's up to you whether you have your cameras obviously on or off, um, whatever you're most comfortable with. Please do go and check out our YouTube channel as well. We've got recordings of all of our seminars on there. Um, if you could remain muted throughout the presentation, that would be great. Uh, don't be offended if we do mute you. Um, if we can hear sort of background noise, um, it's just to make sure that Georgia can present. Um, and she'll be presenting for about 40, 45 minutes so that we've got a bit of time for questions at the end. Um, if you do have questions that you want to ask during the presentation, can I ask you to put those in the chat? Um, or if you want to ask those at the end, we'll use the hand up function. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Georgia. Um, and, and I'm particularly delighted to have been asked to introduce her um, because Georgia and I actually met as undergraduates. So we go back a couple of decades, shall we say. Um, <laughs> but have since re-found each other um, as we've come into patient safety. Um, and I think we've probably both come quite a long way since those horrendous sort of neuroscience supervisions that we were both in. Um, <clears throat> and before I hand over, I'm just going to embarrass her slightly um, with some of the standout things that, you know, I picked out when I was reading her extremely inspiring CV. So George is currently a reader in applied health research at the Wolfson Institute of Population Health at Queen Mary University of London. Um, and she's also in receipt of a very prestigious This Institute postdoctoral fellowship, which looks at patient safety and non-specific symptom pathways for cancer. Um, she acts as an executive committee member of the policy research unit in cancer awareness, screening and early diagnosis. And she's welcomed funding from NIHR, Blood Cancer UK, Cancer Research UK, the Health Foundation and Bart's Charity, to name but a few. Um, so it, it, she is a wonderful person to be coming and opening our seminar series, I think. Um, and I'm delighted and very proud to hand over to her. Um, and I'll be back to chair some of the questions at the end. Over to you, Georgia. Thank you, Shiv. That was um, suitably embarrassing. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, Great. Let me just check that I can see the bits I need to see. All right. Marvellous. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. Um, for those of you who I've not met before, um, I do predominantly research early diagnosis of cancer, but also just um, sort of general sort of patient safety and communication issues in primary care. I'm really interested in in sort of diagnostics in cancer. Um, and I'm a rather late convert to patient safety, probably unlike some of you who've been kind of dyed in the wool um, patient safety researchers. Um, um, also, uh, for interest or sort of disclosure, I'm, I'm not a clinician. I have a, a psychology background. Um, uh, but I've spent really a long time thinking about um, this particular group of patients um, that I'm going to be talking about today, which is sort of high volume of people who uh, get assessed and um, sort of uh, investigated for cancer who present with non-specific symptoms. So I'm going to be talking about uh, my kind of current thoughts, my, my dilemmas and my kind of worries about trying to improve safety and early diagnosis of cancer and explain a bit of the the stuff I've been working on over the last couple of years. So for those of you who aren't cancer researchers, I just wanted to kind of flag why cancer, um, why patient safety is relevant to cancer. It's relevant to all areas of healthcare, but what are the kind of specific issues in cancer? And, um, you know, there are many, many types of cancer. They all have different kind of symptom profiles with lots of overlaps different ways of diagnosing them, different kind of tests and investigations that help us to uh, find out what's wrong with patients. Um, the current diagnostic system in the UK is really explicitly based around um, sort of ideas about risk and, um, and sort of trying to uh, conceptualize cancer risk uh, in quite a numerical way. Um, and it's deeply reliant on sort of suspicion of cancer um, 
but the the sort of concept of suspecting a cancer is quite poorly defined and it is sort of highly variable and um, uncertain. I know some of you are really interested in diagnostic uncertainty, so I thought I'd raise that. The most prominent safety issue in cancer is probably delay. So, you know, in terms of things we're trying to avoid, <laughs> it's delay in diagnosis. Um, so uh, with a huge credit to my ex-colleague, Nora Pashayan, who does a version of this graph, I want to sort of talk to you a bit about, about what we mean when we talk about delay. So um, uh, for those of you who are a little more qualitatively inclined on the um, uh, axis over here on the left, we've got the sort of the size of the, the growing cancer tumor. And on the bottom axis, we've got time, the sort of progression of time. And then we've got, um, uh, there's a certain size at which the cancer becomes detectable. And there's a certain size of tumor at which uh, it becomes symptomatic. So the patient starts to sort of feel the effect of the cancer in their body. And either because it's pressing against other organs or it's <clears throat> causing blood loss, it's broken through a, uh, an organ wall or it's um, you know, making organs act strangely or um, have other sort of systemic symptoms. So let's plot um, the, this primary tumour, so your kind of initial tumour <clears throat> that grows in your body in whatever organ it is. It sort of grows and grows and grows over time and it reaches this point where it becomes detectable and then it reaches the point where it becomes symptomatic. Um, one of the, the sort of really horrendous parts about cancer is that at a certain point the uh, the tumour will become metastatic. That means it's kind of spread throughout the body and can't be controlled very as easily <clears throat> and certainly can't be cured at that point. And that also has its own trajectory of kind of growth um, and detectability and kind of effect on, on the sort of um, bodily sensations of the patient. So there's a point beyond being symptomatic where um, I'm not talking about screening today. So we're only talking about symptomatic patients. So there's a point where the primary tumor becomes um, clinically detected, i.e. a doctor um, uh, or a radiographer or whoever does a test that means that we, we start to sort of detect um, that the patient might have cancer in, in the real world. And um, <clears throat> so we often talk about this period between when the patient becomes symptomatic and when it's actually detected as a sort of a critical interval or delay, sometimes it's um, whether it's a, a sort of normal or a good interval or a delayed interval is quite subjective. It's really hard to define. Um, but that's really the period that I am interested in in my research is what can we do for patients who are already symptomatic to ensure that the time between feeling the symptom for the first time and being diagnosed with cancer is not um, too long or is as short as possible. The problem is that um, uh, both all of these time intervals are dependent on the sort of natural characteristics of the tumor itself. So some are slow growing, some are fast growing. So I'm just going to give you a different example of where the primary tumor is growing at a similar rate as before, but the metastatic growth is uh, a lot faster and starts a lot earlier, <clears throat> in which case we may only detect the tumour once um, the cancer is already metastasized, in which case the, the issue of delay um, is a different one. We might be thinking that there's a sort of error involved. So, you know, was there an opportunity for someone to detect the cancer earlier? Was it missed? And it's obviously going to have a huge impact on clinical outcomes. So this is really what we're interested in, is trying to diagnose cancer very quickly so that we minimize the chance, or we let's say we maximize the chance of detecting the cancer before it's metastasized. And um, I feel it would be remiss of me not to mention the fact that not all cancers, even if diagnosed early, can be um, cured. So, but we know that being diagnosed earlier is better for patients, even if that's the case. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a bit about my particular area of diagnosing cancer, which is patients with non-specific symptoms. So apologies to the clinicians in the audience. I'm just going to explain a little bit about what I mean by non-specific symptoms. So for me, there's kind of two types of non-specific symptoms. One is the sort of undifferentiated system um, symptoms, but that are clearly sort of located in one part of the body. So something like a cough is clearly in the lungs. We don't know what causes it, 
there's so many reasons why you might cough or be constipated or feel sick. Um, so they're undifferentiated in terms of, you know, there's lots of potential diagnoses, lots of potential reasons to experience those symptoms. Um, but we know where they are. We know that the coughs in the lungs, we know that nausea is in the stomach and so on. Uh, then there's a set of sort of non-site specific um, symptoms. So this is where we don't know where in the body the symptom is acting. So things like being anemic, uh, having low iron in the blood, um, or um, weight loss, or having sort of general abdominal pains around the middle of the body, feeling tired. Those are ones where we can't pin it to a specific organ. So um, just for interest, for those of you that are not familiar with this field, I'd say approximately 50% of patients with cancer present with non-specific, either undifferentiated or non-site specific symptoms um, for cancer in the first instance. Um, so most, most patients don't have the really obvious lumps and bumps and blood and stuff that we kind of associate with uh, more strongly with cancer. And so of course, because all of these symptoms could be related to a number of different diagnoses, um, no one panics when they have these symptoms, do they? They just um, think it could be something really normal. Um, and that's kind of major safety problem is that it doesn't kind of spur in anyone into action, not the patient and not the GP. So they have low, what we call positive predictive values for cancer. That means on their own, any one of these symptoms doesn't really increase the likelihood of you having a cancer very much at a population level. So to sum up, this means that diagnosing cancer, especially those associated with low risk or sort of non-specific symptoms is inherently really risky and unpredictable. Uh, it's impossible to reduce the uncertainty and the risk in this context. Um, and uh, my very loose understanding of different types of risk is that this is called an aleatory risk. So it's kind of got this inevitable variability and unpredictability to it. And so this means there will be an unavoidable number of diagnostic errors and um, associated harms. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what those might look like shortly. Um, so nationally, we have a pretty strong focus on early diagnosis of cancer and our, our sort of approach is to try and um, solve some of these safety issues about delay at a, a kind of policy level have been to look at things like um, creating urgent suspected cancer referral pathways. So um, if your GP suspects that you might have a cancer, you have a dedicated pathway for investigating cancer, which is sort of prioritized over and above routine referrals in hospital for each um, clinical specialty. Um, there's a 28 day standard associated with diagnosis. So um, those specialists on the urgent suspected pathways have to rule in or rule out cancer within 28 days of being referred. Um, we have nice guidelines that sort of help GPs to know which symptoms should provoke one of these urgent referrals. Um, we have a kind of nationally agreed risk threshold of 3%. So that means if your symptoms indicate at a population level that you've got a 3% risk of having cancer or above, that is a grounds for referral. That's a completely um, socially agreed number. That was just the NICE committee <laughs> agreed on that. Um, but that seems reasonable. And it was lowered from a previous threshold of 5%. Um, I'm particularly interested in non-specific symptom pathways, uh, um, particularly those that are sometimes called rapid diagnostic centers, which is what my This Institute Fellowship is based on, but I won't be talking so much about them today. Um, and we have the introduction of kind of protocolized diagnostic pathways. So um, kind of very strict um, and standardized ways of investigating certain um, cancers like um, esophageal cancers is always done in the same way. You always get the same test for every patient in the same order, <clears throat> excuse me. So these are the things that the government have introduced over the last, I would say um, sort of, well, when did the urgent referral cancer pathway start around 2004 or five? So sort of getting on for 20 years worth of efforts to promote early diagnosis of cancer. Oh, sorry, and we have a screening program. It's obviously really important. Okay. 
So now I want to talk a bit about this idea of aleatory risk and how it manifests in practice. You know, what do we see due to this fact that there's this kind of irreducible um, risk? And I've completed a few studies kind of looking at uh, this issue of what happens in general practice. I'm going to talk a bit about these now. I'm not going to go into tons of detail about methods, so I'm putting the references in the slides as I go so that if you want to look up, you know, how many people <laughs> we interviewed or whatever, um, you can you can go for that or you can ask me about it later okay <clears throat> so i'm going to take you on a little journey uh, to discuss uh to sort of introduce you to this idea of what could go wrong so let's imagine uh, a patient who is at home and starts to experience um a cancer related symptom and they decide that they excuse me need to go and seek help from the gp uh, they will then see the GP uh, and then they will um, leave the GP and go off and um, think about what the GP has told them and receive advice. Um, and then any number of things can happen. They can um, they might have been given medication. They might have been told to uh, see how their symptoms develop. Um, they might have been given some advice. They might be referred for some tests and so on. And so what we tend to find is that the, the kind of where things go wrong the most often is in this period here. So not in the GP's consultation room, but in the period after the patient has left. And the kind of things that can go wrong are um, patient getting lost in the system. This is sort of generic uh, patient safety stuff, isn't it? I'm sure all of you have encountered this kind of stuff in the past. Uh, the GP giving inadequate referral information, causing the patient unnecessary anxiety about cancer risk, um, causing the patient to be reluctant to seek further health care, causing them to decide not to follow the GP's advice. Um, they might not attend outpatient appointments. Oh, excuse me. For some reason, it's decided to go off on its own. Um, <clears throat> they might make unnecessary use of unplanned health care like emergency pathways. So. These are all things that really happen in this kind of period after the patient has initially seen the GP. Um, of course, there are things that can go wrong in the consultation, but uh, in terms of the kind of greatest impact on delay, research says it's in this, um, this period after the consultation. So it's really difficult to make quality improvements to these types of errors um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about, about why, but mainly um, because it's really hard for GPs to get reliable feedback about their diagnostic performance. The only time a GP really knows that something's gone wrong is if they miss or significantly delay a cancer diagnosis, which I know from, from interviewing them is a really awful experience for GPs and, and it will always provide a source of huge kind of improvement and audit and root cause analysis in the practice but it's really rare it's really really rare for a GP to miss a cancer what's more common is that this is sort of high volume process errors and delays um, that happen for um, patients who end up not having cancer um, but it, and it's highly subjective things like you know how how long is it you know how much delay is an acceptable delay it's really subjective um, and patients tend not to give their GPs feedback if they end up not having cancer at all um, about whether their management or communication was effective. So all this stuff you can see on the screen now, I think GPs are generally kind of unaware of unless um, the patients um, end up diagnosed with a missed cancer. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying that all these errors and risks are sensitive to an inequality gradient. So much higher likelihood of these errors for patients who have lower socioeconomic status, don't speak English, have lower health literacy and so on. OK, so what to do about it? So <clears throat> I want to talk about the interventions that have been um, designed to try and attempt to reduce delays uh, in this interval. Um, so what are they? things like educational campaigns. So before the patient is even symptomatic, we quite often get campaigns um, about things like the, it's really got a life of its own, this slide, I'm really sorry, um, to make sure patients recognize symptoms and not only for patients, it's also for um, clinicians. Um, 
we have produced an absolutely overwhelming number of guidelines, decision support tools, risk tools, communication tools, communication training <laughs> for the GP to try and get that moment right, that eight minutes in the middle of this pathway when the GP is um, actually with the patient. Um, and of course, um, safety netting. The only intervention really that's been delivered at any great volume and has any presence in policy is safety netting, which some of you are really familiar with. It's the only one that's really acting on this interval because it's trying to give patient tools and information to help them um, kind of monitor their symptoms and um, re-seek help in a timely fashion after they've left the, the GP consultation room. So to sum up, when I look at this, I don't know what you all think, but I think there's far too much responsibility placed on the patient and the GP to get things right. Um, there's, you know, a lot of intervention effort being put kind of in the wrong place. Um, there's relatively little monitoring or anticipation of error. Um, this really feels to me like, you know, what Newman Toker calls low hanging fruit interventions, kind of easy things that you can do to make it feel like you're reducing risk, but you're not really. I also worry a lot about sort of marginal gains, you know, are we really um, doing uh, what we can to um, to do the sort of big bang changes where things can really get a lot quicker or are we endlessly just trying to whittle away kind of a day or two? Of delay here and there and it goes without saying that the, all these interventions the especially the ones in the middle the guidelines and the decision support tools they're entirely dependent on the gp suspecting cancer in the first place and, and that's a real problem because what we know is that um gps don't tend to suspect cancer in in patients that have non-specific symptoms so there are the problems as i see them i'm going to talk a little bit more now about why um, Communi particularly communication tools and safety netting are not doing as much as we'd want them to do in terms of reducing delays and errors. So um, the problem with safety in communication is that it's really uh, hard to make judgments about, it's hard to measure, <clears throat> it's hard to make improvements to, it's, it's not always visible. So I've done studies using videos of GPs and patients uh, consultations and then interviewed the patients and GPs after the consultations and errors and miscommunications are completely invisible in the consultation no one acknowledges the fact that they don't understand each other it's only when you interview them afterwards that um, you find out that they had a mismatch in in what they understood communication errors uh, and kind of misalignments can be both cognitive and emotional so that's difficult cognitive ones knowledge quite easy patient doesn't understand what a symptom means gp can explain it but emotional differences and and uh errors can be harder to rectify um so as i said unrecognized errors lead to the, the biggest delays if we don't know that something's go wrong gone wrong then we can't fix it Generally, I would say that GPs are fantastic natural communicators. I, you know, do I've done a, a study looking at kind of health literacy with um, my uh, MSc student Jennifer Byrne. This paper down at the bottom, um, we found that you know really high proportion of GPs uh, follow what we might see as kind of evidence-based guidelines for um, communicating well. Uh, but they are not so good at following quite sort of technical ways of communicating that increase the likelihood of kind of safe communication for patients with lower health literacy. I don't know if any of you have heard of them, but there are techniques like teach back, which is where you get the patient to kind of repeat the information you've just given them back to you. But they're not very natural. That's not the kind of thing any of us would do unless we've been specifically trained to do it. Um, so communication is also really context dependent and um, you know, GPs who work in highly deprived areas or with lots of um, patients with uh, language needs, they'll do it very differently to, to in, in different contexts. Um, it's dependent on the patient's comorbidities, the regularity within which the patient visits the practice and so on. Okie dokie. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about safety netting, which um, if those of you aren't I'm sure absolutely everyone on the call knows what safety netting is, but I'm just going to go through the nice description of it. And um, so we're on the same page. So um, but 
nice says that safety netting is telling people what symptoms to look out for and when they should return for re-evaluation and that you might um, provide written information what you want is to make sure that things like um, blood tests or kind of um, uh, direct uh, investigations by the GP are reviewed and acted upon um, quickly and and being aware of things like false negative results um, and reviewing the patient so making sure that if a patient's still experiencing symptoms that you you see them again in primary care within a time frame that you've agreed for the person or allow the patient to make their own decision about when they need to come back so to sum up uh, what that means uh, you want to tell the patient a bit about the symptoms that might indicate that they should come back tell them what to do and then within what time frame so this is kind of what nice says is like the holy trinity of of how we ensure safety in that time frame after the gp consultation um, so my kind of favourite paper uh, about safety netting is this fantastic realist review by my colleague Claire Friedman Smith, who, um, if any of you have not done a realist review, what it does is link the sort of um, context and mechanism and outcomes of an intervention. So what works and in for whom and in what context. Um, and she really, I'm not going to explain this diagram because it's quite complicated, but um, she uh, really goes into some detail about um, all the contingencies that make safety netting work and particularly things like that the patient has to be seen and heard and taken seriously and that um, they have to understand the kind of rationale for the follow-up plan and so on. So th this is really a lot more sophisticated than what NICE have. And so if I was to summarise Claire's um, sort of thesis about how safety netting works, it would be not only symptoms and action and time frame, but also things like the clarity of communication, the documentation to support it, validating the patient's feelings and so on and so on. So these are all good. These are kind of, you know, blueprints for good um, safety netting. But the a couple of studies that I've worked on are looking at safety netting in practice. So what's actually happening in primary care? Um, what do GPs do uh, when they're doing safety netting? So uh, myself and a whole load of people, including your own team, have done some work looking at um, uh, safety netting. And what I would sort of conclude drawing all these papers together is that sort of crucial things wrong with safety netting at the moment is that it's often delivered in a way that's weak or neutral, sort of too vague, you know, things like, oh, we'll come back if it doesn't get better, rather than giving that very specific kind of symptoms and time frame and actions. Um, it's very hard for GPs to maintain consistency for every patient. In fact, they tend to do it better for patients that they're more worried about, which is kind of antithetical to um, patient safety. We have to be just as robust, just as safe, even for the people who we don't perceive to be at high risk. Um, pay, uh, GPs are, are hugely overloaded in general, now more than ever. And uh, if you have uh, an increased workload of course that decreases your ability to be thorough with things like safety netting advice there's always um, the possibility that patients will not understand or not interpret safety netting advice correctly and I have to say a lot of the guidelines about safety netting are really based on sort of consensus rather than evidence so you know what's happened in the past is they've got a load of GPs together in a room and said hey guys what do you think safety netting should look like and it's sort of been generated through discussion rather than actually looking at evidence of how patients behave so you know if safety netting is delivered in a particular way what's the impact on patient behavior um, so I, had, I tried to address that in a study where I interviewed um, patients who'd received safety netting advice and their GPs. Um, it all got a bit bungled by COVID, so we didn't have as many pairings as I would have liked. Um, but one thing we found really strongly is that patients um, interpret safety netting incorrectly if it's delivered in that sort of passive um, vague way so it's very easy for a patient to perceive that they don't have permission to return to see the GP um, it's not only interpreted as kind of vague it's interpreted as dismissive so um, you know if if it's delivered in a passive way it's almost worse than nothing it's almost like saying you shouldn't have come um, so I'm giving an example of of what that kind of vague um, safety netting would look like here on the right 
um, if anything changes, you get a high temperature on well in any way, then come back to us. OK, so there's there's no kind of specific action. It's not come and see me or ring the receptionist or explain that you were here before. And it, it doesn't give a specific time frame. Uh, and when we analyzed videos, we found that this was mostly how um, safety netting was delivered. And particularly the time scale is the one that's often missing. Another reason why um, uh, patients might interpret safety netting incorrectly is that it's always delivered at the end of the consultation. And I know that makes sense because you've just had a conversation about the symptoms and what you think might be wrong. But the way it's delivered um, is quite often using a sort of phraseology that implies that it's the end of a consultation. So, um, so in our video study, literally not one patient asked for clarity or asked to discuss the safety netting plan or asked um, any questions that would imply they hadn't understood it or whatever. They just always moved on to the next thing or went to get their bag or coat and, and walked out of the consultation room. Um, so I've given you an example again on the right of how, how that kind of um, sentence formation gives that implication that it's a kind of um, a closure of the conversation. OK, so another problem that I have with safety netting at the moment is those it's doing too many jobs, <laughs> is what I perceive. Um, so when we looked at um, video data of uh, GPs delivering safety netting advice, and this was in patients with all sorts of symptoms, so not just um, cancer related symptoms, but just kind of anything that came into primary care, any new or persistent symptoms. Um, actually, they are often giving advice about what to do if symptoms persist. Um, or, you know, and there's about one in five that are about kind of being aware of new symptoms that may crop up. So if you start coughing up blood or if you start feeling sick or this or that, then come back to us. So sometimes it's about that. But, um, you know, and this is where I think the safety researchers among you will be interested that um, nearly 8% of safety netting advice mentions preventing loss of investigation results. So what they're safety netting against is not the appearance of a new symptom, but the likelihood that you're um, investigation results will get lost. So there's safety netting against kind of administrative errors. And um, if you look at all these ones in red around the left, you know, you might have problems accessing secondary care, you might have problems accessing primary care. Those are the kinds of things that GPs are using safety netting to communicate. Um, and again, I've given you an example of that in the in the bubble. Um, so it's tricky. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in primary care and GPs are really aware of that. That's what this says to me and that they're using safety netting to sort of paper over really a lot of cracks um, in the system, including the sort of diagnostic uncertainty around the non-specific symptoms. So to summarize, it's just doing too many jobs. Um, it's a symptom monitoring intervention. It's also an administrative safety intervention. Um, it has this really important role in validating the patient. So we saw from Claire's review that that's such an important part of it. Um, you're avoiding over reassurance. You're trying not to dismiss the patient, make them feel valued. Um, it's also a relationship tool. So it's maintaining um, the idea that the patient and the GP are working together to kind of um, main you know to sort out the patient's problem but it's also a time management tool so hang on a second sorry it's not a good time sorry um uh, and it's also a time management tool so it's a way for the gp to end their discussion um with the patient okay so those to me are really significant problems that we need to address in safety netting i'd be really interested to hear what the snap team have to say about that um, so what's the alternative then in this, this bit of the patient journey here where uh, all the problems are? If, if safety netting is not going to cut it on its own, what else can we do? And um, I'm going to talk to you a bit now about um, my sort of thoughts about trying to extend this to um, a systems approach to early diagnosis. So this is a diagram from a very recent study that I had not study, sorry, opinion piece that I had um, published in the BMJ, um, which is where I try and kind of outline a potential alternative. And um, I don't want to go through the diagram in more detail, but I'm trying to describe the entire system of diagnosing um, cancer in a symptomatic patient and thinking about um, 
where things could go wrong and where we could have a systems approach that would monitor and kind of in, um, mitigate against those errors that cause lengthy delays. So um, there's absolutely no, I have to say, pathological basis for this six week total that I've suggested. It's not like six weeks would be an acceptable interval between being symptomatic and being diagnosed. Um, but I had to go with something. So um, if anyone's got any thoughts about that, then obviously I'm happy to hear it too. So here's an example then where a patient maybe visits the GP because they're feeling fatigued and the GP suggests a lifestyle modification. Uh, but the patient's symptoms persist and um, uh, the patient doesn't sort of immediately go back to see the GP. And so after two weeks, we could envisage a system where the patient is sent a text automatically to ask whether their symptoms resolve and that this then triggers a second appointment. So rather than the patient having to remember, oh, yes, oh, maybe I should go back because the fatigue hasn't resolved or maybe they feel a bit unsure about whether the GP wants to see them again, this would trigger um, that behavior. Um, so I've described, I'm, I'm not going to go through it all, but I've described other kind of ways that uh, particularly sort of electronic patient record or trackers could be used to mitigate these errors, like the patient forgetting to go for a blood test or the patient not being sure how their blood tests are going to be received. Um, so not, there are bits of this kind of infrastructure in primary care, but it's not conceived like this. Um, yet as a whole um, and I think that's something that really warrants our attention in the future. So I want to give an example of a system that does exist in primary care um, that attempts to mitigate some of these delays but to me um, is not yet functioning as a system intervention and I'll tell you why. So um, some of you may have heard of a, a bit of software that's called See the Signs that was developed by doctors and um, software engineers for um, GP to be sort of um, installed within the GP patient record. <clears throat> and what it does is um, several things. So you can um, put in the patient's symptoms and it can recommend um, different pathways for referral and tests that the GP might do. It kind of um, summarizes the NICE guidelines in other words, but it also kind of reminds GPs about different um, pathways that they might want to use. Um, once the GP has referred the patient, it keeps them on a kind of tracker so they can check whether the patient's results have come in and whether it's um, their investigations in secondary care are getting delayed. It also fills in the referral form automatically. Um, so you can sort of see why it was seen as a potentially useful tool and um, I did a rapid evaluation of this for a local cancer alliance um, just involving some interviews with um, primary care practice staff um, and what we found was really interesting which is that there were two ways in which it was implemented in one case um, they it was a sort of whole practice adoption so this is where everyone in the GP practice installed the software um, it was mandatory, so every referral had to be um, generated through See the Signs. There were no other safety netting systems um, that were used. There were no other kind of spreadsheets or lists of patients that were being investigated for cancer. Um, mostly, these were practices that had a very stable workforce, so lots of permanent GPs, practice partners, um, fewer trainees or locums. Uh, and they really got the most out of it. So, for example, they would maybe have an administrator who was checking and monitoring for delays um, constantly so that that responsibility was taken away from the GP. So some practices did that and that was seen as good. Some practices did it in a completely different way. They just let GPs who wanted to install it on their computers. And so it was completely self-directed. It was an individual choice by each GP to um, use it or not use it. And sometimes the practice had multi sa multiple safety netting systems on the go. So they might have see the signs, but they also had their own spreadsheet tracker that they would then have to fill in. Um, some GPs also made notes in their own diaries and stuff. So they had lots of different things going on. Um, there was very limited use of the decision support tool, but it was uh, as in you know, choosing which um, uh, pathway to refer to. Um, but there was more use of that in this this kind of group of practices and this tended to be in this um, in practices where there was more of a locum workforce so temporary 
and uh, where there was poorer IT infrastructure. So uh, in terms of the functions that See the Science has, what we found really interesting was GPs just didn't use all the functions that were available. So very few GPs would put in the symptoms and then see what it recommended in terms of um, which pathway or which tests to do first. And I can understand that. I mean, GPs, um, this is their bread and butter. Most of them know the guidelines for cancer very well. They prefer to use their own judgment, but it does mean that the sort of any potential benefit from that is um, eclipsed if you don't use it. Um, and very few of them used it to track anything other than two week wait referrals. So in theory, you can also use see the signs to track um, primary care led investigations like blood tests and um, x-rays, stuff like that. Um, what was really well used was the, <laughs> the sort of automatic completion of the two week wait forms uh, and the use of the dashboard or tracker where they were looking at all the two week wait referrals. Uh, so that's not a surprise. Filling in a form automatically saves the GP loads of time. So it's really understandable to me why they would find that more useful. Um, so our recommendations were that um, there were some potential benefits to using See the Signs for the, the two week wait, the urgent suspected cancer pathway, but it's really only realized when the whole practice is aligned in their approach. And so again, like really points to this idea of system safety, where you want to spread responsibility um, and kind of track everything that's happening in the entire diagnostic system and not just one bit of it. It's not really that effective when it's only one GP who's using the intervention. Um, it works much better when there's that distribution of responsibility for monitoring between clinical and administrative staff. Um, the decision making tool may have very little benefit for experienced GPs, but it might be much better for trainees and early career GPs who are not so familiar with um, cancer guidelines. Um, and it's also clearly really highly dependent on, on fast computers and, and lots of staff training so that they all know what all the functions are and how to use them. But ultimately, and here's the bottom line, and thinking back to my first slide where I had the kind of delay, I don't think there's very much evidence that see the signs affects or can mitigate against delays in cancer diagnosis because you don't use the tool unless you already suspect cancer. So there may be some small marginal gain in delay, but I don't think this is really um, the game changer software <laughs> that I'm looking for anyway. And I appreciate if people have different views on that. So some colleagues and I came up with a framework for electronic safety netting tools to try and think, you know, if we were to design one from scratch and we haven't yet, and that's really hard, and I concede that I've not done anything like what the See the Science team have done, uh, we were trying to design what, what we thought would make a kind of perfect um, tool. So uh, I'm not going to repeat myself, but it's a lot of the functions that I was kind of talking about before that I felt were missing. So things like auto detection of pathway process deviations. So automatically detecting when things have gone wrong rather than relying on a person to notice it. Um, simple processes for transferring complex data and distributing roles and responsibilities. So if you want to have a look at that paper, it's in um, uh, JMIR Medical Informatics. OK, this is my last slide, so I'm ready for questions soon. Um, and I, I don't want to kind of do just a, a summary, but I want to tell you kind of where I've got to in my thinking and then see how how you your research kind of intersects with this. So. My view is that we need to move away from just relying on educational and communication interventions. They just don't do enough. Um, it's not enough to tell patients about symptoms um, when they don't feel encouraged to seek help. That's just, it, you know, it doesn't, it's not just recognizing a symptom as a cancer symptom. Um, I can see that it's really easy to spot where a systems approach would be help and it's much harder to create it. This is one of the one of the kind of great problems with um, system safety is um, it's really complicated. Um, we have to make GPs jobs easier at all costs. The, anything that increases the burden on the GP is going to decrease safety. This is, you know, this has come up again and again and again in my research. So we just absolutely have to do that. My feeling is that we've been a bit obsessed about making marginal gains approaches and a little bit less interested in kind of big bang approaches like 
things that make a really substantial difference to delay. And, and we are looking ahead now to sort of blood tests that will detect multiple cancers, the so-called MSEDs. Those may be the sort of big bangs, the paradigm shifts of our generation, but there must be other technological um, interventions that have that same kind of um, step change in safety. Um, and I'd be really interested to know what people like me who are primarily cancer researchers can learn from other healthcare specialties. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see you all. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Georgia. That was fascinating. And certainly as somebody who isn't in this specific area, I think it was so clear and wonderfully presented as well. Um, I'm going to go straight to questions. So if anybody does have a question, um, do you want to pop your hand up? I'm sure the SNAP team uh, might have some <laughs> questions and or comments on some of that as well, uh, based on their work. Oh, I can see everybody. Anybody got any questions for Georgia? I feel like maybe you've answered all of them. <laughs> Lynn, do you want to come in with your question? Yes, thank you so much, Georgia. That was um, so interesting. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking about what you said about um, it's really important to make uh, very um, busy GPs' jobs easier. And when I was looking at the whole systems approach, I was thinking if, if I was imagining all the hundreds, maybe hundreds of thousands of people in that first step that you showed, where they've gone, they've been asked, um, you know, come back if you, you know, if you don't feel any better and they just didn't feel encouraged to do that. Mm. If, if they were all getting emails or texts saying, do come back and they did, presumably that would generate masses of work. But is your feeling that that would be more than offset by the masses of work that happened later on when people who should have got in touch get in touch when they're really, you know, it's, it's, it's too late? Yeah, that, so um, that's great. And actually, I, I didn't really mention the kind of problem of, demand Lynn so thanks for bringing that up yeah there is huge worry with every kind of intervention in that space in that sort of bit after the consultation that it will unnecessarily do two things one make too many patients you know create unsustainable demand on primary care and I understand that the second is raise patient anxiety so those are the kind of two um uh kind of great worries with introducing any intervention that drives presentation my feeling is that most patients, if their symptoms have gone away or resolved, will see the text and think, oh, no, actually, I am better. It's fine. Um, as long as it's worded carefully. So obviously, if you introduced an intervention like that, you would have to do lots of user testing to check that the language was right so that it didn't drive unnecessary um, representation. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I mean, you would hope that it uh, it would mitigate kind of... Um, higher use of healthcare later down the line that for sure mm -hmm. thanks thanks lynn for that question um jenny's put one in the chat jenny do you want to come in um on on that or do you want me to read it out i feel like you're here you're chatty hi uh, um sorry thanks george that was really great what i actually put in the chat was um i got more of an apology for what's probably a really rubbish question oh. <laughs> but what I'm wondering is um, what learning is there from other countries where um, early diagnosis of cancer rates are better than in this country yeah um, it's not a daft question it's the right question um, well they've got more of everything Jenny they've got more GPs per head of population they've got more diagnostic access per head of population so um i think the average wait time for a ct in the netherlands is something like three days for patients <laughs> i don't know what it is currently in the uk <laughs> it's not three days i'm telling you that um so there may be different thresholds i mean something that i'm interested in is whether there's the same i don't know much about things like the risk thresholds like whether say Denmark Norway they're, they're the leaders in in non-specific symptom pathways for sure whether they have a different risk threshold for investigation that's something I'd have to um 
look into but yeah we can learn a huge amount from those countries that they're, they're just so much better resourced and have really thought more carefully about this that's for sure thanks jen um lucy i see you've got your hand up there do you want to come in um, yeah, it's probably less of the question, <laughs> um, but um, I currently work um, for a hospital trust and we're um, taking our NSS service out into primary care. Mm -hmm. So kind of what you've been saying is really, really interesting and giving sort of some real, because we're sort of doing it on a on just two PCN basis, but it's like the already we're only in early sort of negotiations with PCNs about how it'll look and everything. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the concerns is will we get enough patients? But from what you were saying about, you know, potentially we could pick up the patients who have already had that one consultation that in your model you were saying if we could get a text message at two weeks do you know what I mean there could be yeah. something that we can do around that once we're um kind of working there so your NSS pathway will be delivered by a primary care we team. our 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 clinical nurse specialist will go out sort of two days a week say into a primary care network um she'll have referrals from yeah the PCN should be able to do those filter tests so where the time saving is is that they're getting that she's getting that referral earlier without sort of probably after a couple of you know and once they've been to see the GP one yeah. and things haven't improved then that's when she'll get the referral in. Um, I'd be super happy to talk to you separately if you like because my fellowship products project's all about NSS pathways but um, I mean I presume your local cancer alliance and stuff will do a load of comms with GPs about how to drive the referrals and the appropriate patients to refer and stuff I mean there's pretty stringent criteria about which patients are appropriate for those pathways so once the GPs know I think they'll all be loving it and send you all the patients with yeah 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 sure um, <laughs> That's, my, that's been my experience with other services is it started with a trickle and then once the GPs got wind of how to do the referral and where to send them, they got inundated. So yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think it'll be a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, to, to sort of, we, we've already got, so we get about 240 referrals a year. Sort yeah. of in that, uh, so it's just trying to expand that. And, you know, so it's the cancer lines that have funded this to go in as part of an innovation but yeah I'm happy to chat with you another time or whatever yeah, yeah. brilliant thanks Lucy um I'm just mindful of time so Pawan do you want to come in and then I think we've had a question from Liz in the chat as well um so we'll make those the last two questions thanks Georgia really um interesting talk and um just picking up on the the, the point that was made one of we've just launched our NSS pathway locally and something that I'm very keen to do, and I've got a GP fellowship GP who's interested too, is actually tracking back the patient's journey prior to being referred, which we haven't got a huge amount of data on. And what I'm particularly interested in is how many other diagnostic pathways patients have been down before reaching the NSS pathway. And in part, that's due to the way that we filter and require particularly stringent testing. And in fact, it's going back to medical school, doing all the tests that you would do in the sequence that you would do them, et cetera, et cetera. But um, just going on to your systems approach and the idea of time texts, that's a system that mm -hmm. we already have in play. Okay. And it'd be there's um, a particular software product called AccuRx. And that has the um, ability to send time texts. And in particular, um, it's proving to be quite a useful option when it comes to doing symptomatic fit testing. Oh, yeah. So that you can send a text immediately together with a follow-up text a few days later, all within the one action within the, the primary care consultation. So it's key that you're thinking about that and then that you just press the right button. But once you've pressed the button, then you don't need to do anything more from that perspective. So I think that there are little bits in there along with safety netting um, systems. The other thing that um, mm. might be relevant um, within your systems approach is perhaps thinking about um, predisposing risk. And I'm thinking in particular of Lynch and BRCA because we have such a, a push now for national testing of all endometrial 
breast and bowel tumors to try and find that and then finally i guess there's also something important in all of this about gut instinct <laughs> and how the uh, in denmark um, gut instinct that a gp has is one of the drivers that will allow you to grade the urgency with which a request is processed so there's but then that's now challenged by the discontinuity within primary care because of the pressures yeah, I couldn't agree more. So on that last point, um, gut feeling is also a criterion for, I'm sure, I'm sure you know, but just for the benefit of others. So a GP can refer a patient on a non-specific symptom pathway just on the basis of gut feeling. There's been a whole load of researchers who've looked into what gut feeling really means in terms of sort of complex pattern recognition. Um, and it's a lot of people are very worried about how gut feeling is undermined by overuse of telephone consultation. So that's a ripe area for research right now. How do we generate, you know, how do we triage which patients need to come in so that we can see them walk in funny or, you know, see that their trousers are baggy or whatever, you know, I, I get all of that. That's super important. Shiv, how are we doing for time? We've gone over. We? <clears throat> We've gone slightly over. So I think there's okay. a question from Liz and from Gemma, but what I might do is, you know, those two, I think, um, and might have spoken to them. So I might just yeah. forward those questions on and you can answer those uh with those two separately i guess all righty but that has been brilliant thank you so much thank you so much to georgia and to everybody and um, you're getting a lot of love in the chat um and um i think we've got another presentation uh by jane o'hara on the 30th of march so uh look out for that as well um and yeah just a huge thanks again to you georgia that was brilliant and thank you for coming you're welcome thanks so much everyone it was lovely to see you all Speak to you all soon. Bye. Bye.